So welcome to the latest edition of Plants and People podcast. My name is Robin Harford from eatweeds.co.uk and I'm here today with Ted Bro from Jade Liqueurs who has come all the way from America. Even though we're talking on Skype, he is actually in London. So welcome on the show, Ted. Good to have you. Good to be here, Robin. Good to uh, be, be back in the UK and uh, great to finally speak with you. Um, I have... Uh, Certainly, I, I'm I'm presently enjoying your website. Great deal of information there. I, I bought your um, your cookbook straight away, which uh, looks like a, a load of fun. Uh, quite a few things in there that I recognize and even have at home, and it's great to uh, get some ideas on uh, how to consume them in ways that appear to be both interesting and delicious. Well done, sir. Thank you. Well, I hope maybe because the reason I brought you on is that you are. A world authority on absinthe and the shenanigans and the kind of mythology that goes along with the drink absinthe. So what, which obviously is made with a plant called wormwood. That's so, correct. And uh, as you uh, have discovered, there are much shenanigans and myths associated with the spirit. Um a little background, uh, I am a research scientist, I'm a microbiologist and chemist um, by profession, um, and my um, being from New Orleans originally, uh, there, there is a bar that's on Bourbon Street, one of the famous, most famous streets in the city, uh, the name of the bar is called the Old Absinthe House, it's been operating under that name since the 19th century, and uh, like many people, I had come across the word absinthe, and um, and finally one day, it, it, it just, I stopped and wondered what it meant, and um, this was 23 years ago, and you, you couldn't just look something up on Google back then, and um, being a chemist, I wanted to know what was the reason for the controversy, and uh, I could not get a credible answer, and, and so uh, basically, um, this started a whole journey, from an unplanned journey, that took me not just to the world of spirits, but um, but also into back into history, culture, um, 18th and 19th century uh, pharmacognosy, which is the study of botanical medicine, um, eventually into um, horticulture, permaculture, and all sorts of avenues as a result of that one word, absinthe. Wow. And as you uh, mentioned, absinthe, um, absinthe derives its name from Artemisia absinthium, which the common name is Grand Wormwood. Now, you, you mentioned the term wormwood, and I should, I should note that that term, wormwood, can apply to any plant in the Artemisia species, which are basically a, a Artem, I mean, Artemisia genus, rather, which is a genus that's a full of wormwoods. Um, and of all, of all those, there is one plant, Artemisia absinthium, that is... Uh, a key to absinthe. And um, I might mention that, like many plants, there are various cultivars of that one species. So um, as you can start to see that the rabbit hole goes quite deep where this is concerned. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard a little bit about you. And from what I understand, you basically was, have scoured the globe in search of the obscure, the overlooked and forgotten information regarding what is often, you know, absinthe is a pretty malign subject, yeah? Very much so. Um, absinthe has humble beginnings. Um, you know, when we look at lore of absinthe and, and its history, basically it all seems to start, according to um, um, published legend, in the late uh, 18th century, where it was uh, created as a medicine. You know, when we look back at the world of botanical medicines, uh, we find that in the 19th century, botanical medicines were a panacea. I mean, today we take medicine because we're sick, um, you know, because we're not well. But, you know, back then people took botanical medicines on a daily basis because they believed that it prevented them from getting sick. Uh, they believed, believed it prevented them from suffering afflictions like consumption, uh, common problems of the day. And back in those days, um, absinthe was created as a medicine to promote digestion, which was deemed to be, a, you know, a, an integral a part of good health. And, you know, this all seems fine and dandy until we realize that, you know, absinthe 
If we look at the plants that make up the core of absinthe, that is Artemisia absinthium, which is grand absinthe, Pimpinella anisum, which we know is green anise, and Funiculum vulgare, which we know is sweet fennel. And these, you know, absinthe is such a bitter plant, uh, it was distilled with anise and fennel. Um, a maceration of alcohol that contained the grand absinthe, anise, and fennel. This was distilled to make a palatable medicine. And if we do our, we conduct some research and we look back, we find that even as far back as Culpepper's Complete Herbal from 1653, I, I believe it was first published, which was a groundbreaking tome in that it was published in English as opposed to Latin, which put this precious knowledge of botanical medicine into the hand of commoners instead of just the educated people. Heaven forbid. <laughs> That's right. That's why it was so controversial at the time and, uh, and, and, and why it is you know, continually reprinted even today. But the thing is, we find that Culpepper mentions that, you know, uh, that Grand Wormwood uh, was commonly distilled with aniseeds. So we find that the concept that makes up the, the backbone of what became absinthe was not a new concept. This goes back to, you know, probably to the Renaissance, if wow. not earlier. Yeah. And, um, you know, like uh, many botanical medicines, I mean, it, it, anyone that has, um, uh, has dipped their uh, uh, foot into the, the, the waters of the cocktail kingdom have come across uh, products like Angostura bitters, Peychaud's bitters, you know, these cocktail bitters that have been around for a long, long time. And back in the 19th century, these products were sold um, with, uh, you know, under the promise of um, having medicinal value and with, you know, with uh, marketing of uh, um, medicinal attributes. And um, absinthe was one such product. And the beauty of it is, uh, you know, the French had a stern belief back in those days that uh, wine spirit, any spirit produced from grapes, be it wine or brandy, you know, distilled from grapes, um, was healthy and um, not injurious to the system. And basically, since absinthe was originally uh, uh, distilled as a maceration of these medicinal herbs in wine spirit, it was deemed to be a very healthy product, which of course made it a good excuse uh, for everyone to have their daily medicine of these high proof um, uh, tasty medicinal beverage. That's how it all got started. That's fascinating. So really, I mean, it was just a, it was, a, 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 from what I'm hearing, it was originally a medicinal tonic. And what is it now? What's it, what's it morphed into over the, the times since the kind of, it came, you know, it came back, it came in vogue quite strongly in the 19th century. Is that right? Even though we know it goes back to potentially Culpeper and b before. Is the 19th yes. century the kind of the high, the heyday of it? Yes, the, um, the, the, the 19th century is where it became insanely popular. And that is um, primarily because it was, um, its medicinal benefits were recognized by the French military, who issued, issued it as rations of medicine to their soldiers in Algeria, where it was believed that um, where, where there was water, you know, that was, uh, that was in the field, um, a, a source of water that was not deemed uh, particularly clean, that adding some absinthe to it would render it hygienic enough to drink. Wow. A very interesting concept, but had the um, unintended effect of uh, soldiers developing a taste for this medicine. And, of course, when they returned to con France and, you know, and continental Europe in general, they brought this taste uh, w uh, for this delicious medicine back with them. And this is really responsible for the proliferation of the popularity of absinthe. And that continues throughout the 19th century uh, and just c continues to ramp up, particularly during the period of the 1870s and 1880s, when the vineyards of Europe were ravaged with phylloxera, um, where absinthe more or less replaced wine in France as the national beverage. So what's phy phy phylloxera? Well, phylloxera, interestingly enough, is uh, caused by an insect that um, irreparably harms the, uh, the roots of the grapevine. And the, the problem originated from rootstock that was imported from the U.S. and was actually cured by importing that same rootstock from the U.S., which was uh, immune to it. So basically, it was this introduced pest that ravaged the European vines. 
Um, it's a little little appreciated fact today that uh, most of the uh, vineyards in France uh, are the, the rootstock is sourced from um, the U.S. because of its resistance to phylloxera. And okay. it was during this time that 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 products that were made from grapes, such as wine and brandies, became scarce uh, and expensive and no longer possible for commoners to drink them the way they were accustomed to doing. But fortunately, um, the the invention of the column still, which allowed um, one to produce good, clean, potable alcohol from grain and potatoes and and um, sugar beets and anything that could be fermented, allowed absent producers simply to switch from using grape spirit to um, other sources of agricultural sources of alcohol, and and that enabled the um, absinthe industry to continue while, while wine was down. Okay. The, pr- the problem is, is, you know, back in those days, we didn't have the food and beverage quality control laws that we do today. And um, anyone who studied English history might, right, re- might remember a problem in the late uh, 1600s, I believe it was, called the gin craze, where basically it was a buyer beware uh, situation and many of the um, those uh, the less fortunate who are buying cheap gins were poisoned by these cheap adulterated gins, and basically a century and a half later we had the same situation that happened um, with absinthe, where we had cheap adulterated products, and this really damaged the reputation of the whole category. And where I think probably the most important, my single most important contribution that I made in the world of absinthe came in 2000 when I became the first person to actually take bottles, full unopened bottles representing the best historical brands of the spirit and drawing samples from those bottles and subjecting them to analyses using modern science. And um, I found nothing wrong with them. Wow. So that began a, a paradigm shift in our understanding of the spirit. And it wasn't that there was anything wrong with the spirit when, when properly distilled, you know, grand wormwood. I mean, if you and I walk into a, a good herb shop, I mean, you know, we can point out at least a dozen or so different herbs that a person can, can hurt themselves with if, if not used properly. Sure. And, and grand absinthe is one such herb. But um, when properly distilled, it's, it's, really, it's not a problem. And um, basically, this this be, sort of began our understanding. You know, it's it's amazing when you look back at the 19th century, and we and if we read pharmacopoeia from the 19th century, you know, back when a time when when botanicals represented the state of the art in medicine, you know, it's amazing we find out how much information has been lost, and really, it's you know, for me, it's been about resuscitating this information. Um, Looking at this from a very pragmatic point of view, and stripping away the romance and the and the and the mystique and the myth, to uncover the truth, and you know, fortunately, it's through these efforts and using modern science, basically, we can uncover information about plants, which, um, if it was ever known, has been obscured by the passage of time. You know, we've there was a time when 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 you know, people at the state of the art of, of, of like medicine, you know, thought about these things a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's basically, you know, bringing back sort of this, this, this 19th century mindset, but bringing it into science where certain facts can be, you know, either proved or refuted by modern science. Only now, you know, is our understanding about, I mean, this was a, this was a mystery, you know, with unanswered questions that persisted for well over a century. So it's good to have finally solved them and be able to have brought this beautiful spirit, you know, back to the market exactly the way it was in the 19th century without shortcuts or modern interpretations or, you know, modern, you know, sub- synthetic substitutes and bringing this back so people could experience it the way that it was supposed to be without the injurious effects of the cheap versions of it. And so that's been a mission that has more or less derailed my proper job and professional career and brought me um, into this um, fascinating world, which um, I never uh, envisioned. Um, so who were, who were the, who, from, from your, you know, your studies, your research, who produced the finest absinthe back in the 19th century? Was there, were there any names that stood out? Yes, actually, you know, absinthe was first commercialized in 1797, 
And so the the top producers, which uh, most of which had gotten their start um, um, in the early 19th century, uh, had a long time to perfect their art, decades upon decades. And in reverse engineering these these antique bottles uh, using modern science, which is what I did, um, uh, there are definite there's some definite brands, um, fine uh, French brands such as Pernod Fils, Edouard Pernod, August Juno. Um, find Swiss brands like CF Burger. Um, you know, when, when every once in a while, you know, people often ask me, where, and where on earth does a 100-year-old bottle of absinthe turn up? And, you know, it, it, there are many estates um, that we find that have been in, in families for generate the same family for generations. And many of these chateaus and, you know, estates had their own wine cellars. And um, they bought good things. Um, and so every once in a while, when one of these sellers is liquidated, we find uh, a bottle or even a case of absinthe, and it's always one of the top brands. So that's been um, fortunate for us because it's provided us with the Rosetta Stone, if you, of, if you will, um, of intact liquid um, that uh, gives us the answers, you know, and it's always one of these top brands that we find. Wow. So you mentioned just um, a few minutes back the, there's you know the kind of there's there's the the potential damaging effects of like adulterated or low quality absinthe. What 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 what's going on there? I mean, is is a cheap bottle of absinthe? Obviously, you know, it's like wine. Is a cheap bottle of wine? It's not going to be like a, a high end bottle of wine. But when it comes to the damaging qualities and sort of health impacting qualities, can you expand a bit on what makes a a, a real premium quality absinthe versus something that's going to wreck your liver or well this is a uh, this is um really interesting and this has been the um the the the, the real focus of study um in absinthe and that is to produce a proper absinthe it, one requires five very important things um first of all equipment in my case uh big copper pot stills from the 19th century another one is labor Everything is done by hand. It's a very laborious process of uh, pumping alcohol and, and, and handling a, a tremendous volume of botanicals, which is the third thing. Um, absinthe is expensive to, to produce because it requires a tremendous volume of botanicals to make this concentrated medicine. The other one is energy, all the energy that is necessary for you know a, a full day of, of distillation, uh, volumes of liquid. And number five is time because good absinthe were always rested before going to bottle. So this made absinthe um, a spirit that was, um, that it, it, at least in the beginning, was inaccessible to the lower classes. So whenever something becomes popular or trendy, and it, and it costs a bit, there's always a drive to make cheap versions of it. Sure. And in this case, uh, the cheap versions, which are well documented to have originated in the industrial warehouses of Paris and Lyon, these were fabricated from, first of all, uh, industrial alcohol, alcohol that was not intended for con human consumption because it was contaminated with too many impurities. Um, this is alcohol that was used for solvents. Um, another, uh, you know, absinthe was traditionally um, a tinted green, and that's not because someone decided that it should be green. It's because after the distillation, um, you make an infusion of additional plants that are medicinal um, have medicinal qualities, but are softer and milder in flavor. This contributes another layer of flavor and medicinal attributes, as well as the traditional color. And sometimes, um, with cheap versions, uh, th this step was completely omitted um, in favor of artificial colorants like copper sulfate. <laughs> yes, which makes a, a, a vivid um, artificial green color. Um, that was characteristic of, of absence from the past. Um, one, one journalist from back in the day uh, making the remark that these cheap absence left a distinct metallic taste in one's mouth. Okay. Another, another common adulterate was antimony trichloride, which was used to enhance the louche, which is the clouding effect when water was added that consumers demanded. And if one... Um, studies the effects of chronic poisoning from copper and antimony, um, one comes up with some very striking similarities between those effects and the effects that were 
um, suffered by those who were chronic absent drinkers who drank these cheap products. So, you know, today, if you want to put something on the shelf uh, and call it Scotch whiskey or, or London gin, yeah. there are very specific guidelines that one has to follow with the production um, to be able to, to be deserving of those classifications because they're defined legally. And this is to protect both the industry and consumers alike. Well, there was never any such laws regarding absinthe. You could put anything in a bottle and call it absinthe. And that's part, partly uh, to blame for why these things happen and why the category suffered. Okay, so one of the one of the the myths that that I certainly believed until I was um, <laughs> corrected by your friend Jenny is, and I think it's a it's a common myth that that does the rounds is the thujone content. What's what is it? What purpose does the thujone add to as you called it the consecrated medicine that is absent that is a great question and i am um i'm i'm happy that you asked that because it's one that um of course i'm, I'm asked this question uh, frequently sure and um you know when when the wine industry was emerging from uh, their uh devastating blow of phylloxera and finding themselves with absinthe as a direct competitor um, naturally, they wanted to capitalize on the fact that a small segment of the market were these adulterated products that were causing harm to these people, and they wanted to um, um, they wanted to parlay that into a a huge smear campaign to um, claim that absinthe was a poison. And if you want to uh, if you want to blame absinthe, um, we need to find something that exists in absinthe that we find in very little of anything else. And the most obvious uh, target would be Artemisia absinthium, because yeah. there's not a whole lot of commercial products that employ Artemisia absinthium. It's it's uh, it's certainly an herb that we a herb that we find in Chartreuse, which is another traditional French liqueur, but of course that's kept a secret. But if we if we want to declare absinthe poisonous, and the the obvious thing is to declare Artemisia absinthium is a poison. And if we want to claim that to be a poison, we have to find something in it that we claim to be poisonous. And that would the most obvious thing would be thujone. Thujone is a, a substance produced by many plants, including uh, common um, spices like sage and tarragon, um, cedar. Uh, and the thing is, if um, imbibed in any quantity, um, it is poisonous, like many plant substances. Sure. Um, it, it is something that um, it has no recreational value, so I'm sorry that uh, it won't cause hallucinations. Okay. Um, what, but in, by the, in sufficient quantities, it will cause epileptic seizures, um, which don't have any recreational value. And, <laughs> there, and, and, and there is on record one, um, one unfortunate individual back in the States who actually went to a, a health food shop and purchased some um, oil of wormwood, okay, and imbibed it thinking that was syn synonymous with absinthe, and had a life-threatening um, traumatic event of oh, violent seizures, renal failure. Yes, he recovered, but um, not without uh, extreme medical intervention. So once again, you know, we can go to a herb shop and we can point out, you know, quite a few substances that that a person can injure themselves with. Um, curiously enough, um, you know, we find epileptic convulsants in other plants that, you know, for example, fennel. Um, another one is hyssop, uh, yeah. hyssopus officinalis, a, a traditional uh, European medicinal plant. You know, we can find um, th these sorts of uh, potentially injurious compounds in many, many plants, which which is why I know that, you know, in your, um, in your works, you stress that, you know, with foraging, you know, uh, plants that even we deem edible. Knowledge is always, um, you know, positive identification and a bit of knowledge is uh, extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. As it, you know, as it is with uh, many things, even those plants with which we make spirits, you know, including, you know, many plants used in, in traditional gin can be injurious if, sure. uh, if properly used. Sure. So uh, knowledge is important, as you know. Yeah. So the whole story of the, the, that's been doing the rounds over here, I don't know if it does the rounds in the States, it, about Van Gogh, you know, being addicted, in air quotes, to 
absinthe and thereby that's the reason he painted with those kind of vibrant colors and greens is no there's no foundation in that at all that's pure mythology well we know that we know that um, poor van gogh had some serious psychiatric issues and we know at the time that the, the, uh, there weren't many treatment options for what he had um, it was very interesting that while he was um in one of his uh, holidays of recovery, that uh, he was painting while alternating between glasses of cognac and absinthe. So we know that substance abuse was part of his coping mechanism yeah. and was, uh, was a destructive practice that um, ultimately, yes, played a role in his demise, as well as the most famous story of him having an episode and slicing off a part of his ear. Yeah. Um, yes. So we, we know that he had a lot of problems in... It's uh, it's very um, convenient to go back and, and to say that absinthe was partly to blame, and and we know that it, that uh, absinthe and as well as other alcoholic beverages that he imbibed in copious amounts uh, did not help yeah. his problems. Yes. Well, I mean, um, any any form of al any form of chronic alcohol addiction will produce potentially hallucinations if you consume enough. Well, you know, when we when we go back to those times and we consider the bohemian culture of Paris. Um, which was considered uh, somewhat vulgar um, in, from the Victorian perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. We find that many of these people, you know, this was a day and age when there was no such thing as an illicit substance. When um, fine botanical uh, products such as cocaine and morphine were freely and openly available. Sure. We, we find uh, these bohemian artists eating very little of anything, smoking tobacco all day long, and then... Um, hitting the cafes in the late afternoons and early evenings for multiple glasses of absinthe. Um, you know, the damage from this type of lifestyle uh, being uh, quite evident, not entirely different from the, you know, from the, the rock star lifestyle, you know, that we associate with the yeah. 60s and 70s and the early demise of, of, of many of those um, artists. You know, it's just, it's, it's funny how that works, but um, it's a common theme that uh, goes back to, uh, you know, like all the way back to those times, at the very least. Sure. So the, this this term, the green fairy, that's banded around, is that as a result of the the kind of the coloring that people used to put into the drink? Well, after one has had a few glasses of absinthe on a virtually empty stomach, after uh, ingesting copious amounts of uh, nicotine from smoking a pipe all day long, um, having ice water drip into absinthe in this uh, billowing clouding that 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 he, that it, um, evolves in the glass is somewhat uh, visually stimulating, and um, yeah, that would be the uh, the green fairy uh, okay. that we hear about. Yes, so okay. it is a uh, an optical effect. Yeah. So as, what's the as way? Well as the influence on, on one's mind of uh, several uh, successive glasses of of high proof, uh, intensely herbal spirit. Yeah. On an empty stomach. Yeah, it's quite stimulating, <laughs> I might say. Yes. Yeah. Oh, dear. Okay. Yeah, I don't think anyone's mother was telling them to drink a glass of milk to line the stomach beforehand. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's what my mother used to say when I used to go on the piss. Oh, no, don't forget to drink a glass of milk before you go drinking, Rob. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's your protection, a glass of milk. Yeah. Mm, interesting. <laughs> so what? how is absinthe? Consumed? Is it something you drink before a meal, during a meal, after a meal, and do you use sugar cubes? What's what? What does a connoisseur do? Well, traditionally, absinthe was uh, socially acceptable as either an aperitif or a digestive. The problem is, when used as an aperitif, it's questionable whether one might make it to dinner. So, um, it's uh, <laughs> so in the in, in continental uh, fashion. Um, it's probably best reserved as a digestive where, you know, back in those days, there's so many things that we take for granted today. For example, and you can appreciate this, today it's possible for us to go into a supermarket any time of year and buy seasonable, you know, seasonable uh, vegetables. We can, we, can, we can have constant source of dietary fiber all through the year, yeah. um, which we take entirely for granted. You know, back in those times, that wasn't the case. And during the winter months, um, it was just natural that people's diets became heavy in milk and dairy and root vegetables and not a whole lot of dietary fiber. So at that time of year, um, anything to aid digestion, anything to 
help along the process was appreciated. Um, and, um, and back in those days, we find all these, you know, commercial medicinal bitters, um, which were called blood purifiers, by the way, because it believed that um, improper digestion uh, created bad blood, which caused disease. Absinthe was one of these facilitators. And so, therefore, absinthe traditionally um, had its, its, uh, was most appreciated as a digestive after a heavy meal. Now, this was purely continental. Um, here in, uh, well, I should say in Anglo-American culture, um, which would include, you know, here and in, in, in both in the U.S., um, in the late 19th century, fancy cocktails were becoming very fashionable. And absinthe was used as an ingredient in those fancy cocktails. And even, you know, in, 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 in as, as late as like we find 1930, the Savoy Cocktail Book, named, of course, after the Savoy Hotel in London, um, was... Um, that cocktail book, I tell people, if, if they, I tell bartenders, if I were going to be marooned on a desert island with one cocktail book, that would be the one I would have. And what's it called again? The Savoy Cocktail Book, okay. originally pu published in 1930. And um, in that book are over 100 cocktails that call for absinthe. Wow. And this, this book is a compilation of uh, classic cocktails that go back well into the 19th century, to the mid-19th century. And we find that in many of these cocktails, or there's a, there's a cocktail book called The Mixicologist, published 1895, in which the author makes the, he, he notes that many people find that the flavor of a cocktail is much improved with a small amount of absinthe. So here, you know, in, in Anglo-American culture, we find absinthe being appreciated more so as a cocktail ingredient. And probably is one of the reasons why absinthe was never banned here in the UK. Um, you know, in, 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 in back in, in America, uh, despite absinthe's popularity, uh, we weren't having the problems with uh, the health problems associated with absinthe consumption that were um, realized in continental Europe, mostly because the inferior brands were not imported. Um, they didn't leave France. Um, but the U.S. is a proactive measure, still banned absinthe in 1912. But, um, you know, we find that um, absinthe, um, it didn't, it, you know, it, it's kind of like, for, to put it into perspective, um, for someone in the U.K. Um, in, in 1900, drinking a glass of absinthe in continental fashion might seem uh, like drinking a glass of Angostura cocktail bitters right. as opposed to, to using it in a cocktail. So a bit of a cultural difference there you know, explains why the differences in um, the, the, the difference in the way absinthe was used. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's that's an absolutely fascinating walk through history and the whole world of absinthe. So thank you so much, Ted. But I'd like to to bring the interview round to discussing your own creations. Uh, do you just produce one absinthe? Or is there a range that you do depending on, ooh, I don't know, quality or price for people's pockets? And where, because you're in the UK, um, you know, where can people find out and discover your creations? Your consecrated medicine. I love that phrase. Uh, so do I. I'm going to have to borrow that one. Thank nope, you. That's um, yours. <laughs> you said it. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because um, I, I've had a I've had my finger on the pulse here in the um, in the UK market for a very long time for about uh, about 17, 18 years now, and um, you know the the thing is 17, 18 years ago, if if one were purchasing absinthe here in the UK, one would find something that was basically some 70% alcohol with some sketchy flavoring added to it and some blue-green dye. So this would be like some badly flavored, artificially colored vodka to the tune of 50 quid a bottle. Right. Uh, it was something that one would buy once, um, and that would be the end, which was unfortunate because this sort of uh, recreated the category and killed it at the same time. And um, I, I watched this happen, and you know, back at that time, I was in a very lonely club of people who knew firsthand what vintage absinthe was and what it tasted like and who were alive to talk about it. Right. So for me, it was, uh, I felt I had a responsibility to bring classic, you know, vintage 19th century style absinthe 
back the way it was, reestablish the category, um, which I did, uh, which I which um, I started my first distillation in France in January of 2004. And after uh, much effort and quite a few legal entanglements, uh, both in the in the U.S. and um, in France, I have I'm, I'm pleased to say that I have survived and overcome and uh, w- working um, here with Jenny since uh, around 2009, we've worked very hard, um, both he- uh, here in the UK and-, and abroad, to reprogram, reboot the category with quality products. And I'm pleased to say it's been, it's been very successful. Um, we've done that. And now, so you go to, um, you know, some of the, you know, just, th- there's just a plethora of great cocktail bars in London. Yeah. And um, it's it, it's just it's such a relief to go to these cocktail bars and find these just lovely artisanal cocktails made with, you know, pure wholesome ingredients, wholesome botanicals, um, and using good quality absinthe to recreate the classic cocktail. So that has been a success, and um, it's fortunate for us that um, you know, in me re- reverse engineering and recreating original brands of absinthe, one now can go into fine spirit shops, and not just in London, but, you know, in other cities uh, here in the UK, um, Liverpool, Manchester, you know, down south, um, you know, er- it's just an expanding um, list of cities where one can go and find quality absinthe, wherever the, the global cocktail trend has permeated into the country. And um, and so now, you know, it's possible one to walk into a, a good bottle shop and find quality absinthe. And of course, uh, my products have my products have been um, ha- have been prominently featured here in the UK. Yeah. One can one can find. Uh, I have uh, currently uh, five um, jade absinths that um, one can find here in the UK, which is basically my whole portfolio, as well as my um, Perique tobacco liqueur, which is a different animal altogether and the world's only and completely hygienic. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's not easy to make a hygienic uh, liqueur from a, a plant that has. Um, has killed more people than any other on the planet, but uh, su- succeeded in doing so, fortunately, with much effort. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I guess that makes me a bit crazy, but so be it. Yeah, but, so uh, be it. Yeah, just a bit. But um, but that that's what makes us who we are, doesn't it? Now, absolutely, Robin? it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but fortunately, yes, one can buy good, uh, properly distilled absinthe, and um, there are other producers. I'm not the only one. So uh, I'm pleased to say that um, in this new uh, sort of revolution of uh, craft uh, brewing and, and, and craft distilling that, you know, we do have some uh, interesting craft absence. My, my whole mission was to bring it back exactly the way that it was in the 19th century using the exact same equipment, the same exact same materials, which includes botanicals sourced from the original regions and in some case the original fields where they were grown wow. to serve the absinthe. Oh, that's how that's oh, how wow. um, crazy you know it, it is. From but, but that's how determined I was to to really reproduce this and to bring this back so um so people could experience what what it was that you know that made the spirit the um you know so famous uh, in the 19th century. Yeah, that's fantastic, Ted. That's fantastic. So with um if 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 because I do know that a number of kind of alcohol creators listen to the podcast um, in the UK. Would they approach Jenny? Um, yeah, Jenny. It's uh, Sip or Mix. Is she is, is she, Jenny she, Gardner? Yeah, Jenny Gardner. Yes, and Je- Jenny and I have been working together, like I say, for um, going on eight years now. Um, so um, she, we have a very, very good, close working relationship, and we've worked, you know. And, and the thing is, Jenny and I have worked together. It's not just, you know, of course, you know, um, Jenny imports my brands, but basically, you know, for us, it's just been, it's, it's the whole category, and um, a rising tide lifts all boats, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah. so um, for us, rebooting this category, category has been good. I mean, not just for myself, but other craft distillers as well for the whole cocktail market in general. Um, both here in the UK and abroad. And um, of course, I've traveled globally in the name of doing this. And, um, you know, another, this is really, this whole journey for me, you know, going back into history and, you know, and and you mentioned people that are connoisseurs of alcohol. um, You know, and the thing is, what we must realize is um, there's so many products, uh, so many spirits today Um, artisanal spirits, botanical spirits that we find that are rooted, you know, alcohol is, is a potable solvent for medicinal, um, attributes of botanicals. Yeah. 
And we find that, you know, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, my, my studies go back into, I mean, Latin pharmacopoeia, um, you know, um, going back to the, the 18th century, I um, mean, even earlier. And it's just, it's fascinating for me because I find that the basis of, of many spirits and liqueurs and Amaro, you know, botanical um, liqueurs and everything are rooted in 19th, uh, and 18th and 19th century medicine. Um, been quite a journey. This has certainly uh, diverted me and often to the whole, you know, horticulture um, and all these, uh, you know, foraging. All that, you know, it's it's kind of you and I have paths that cross yeah. in these realms. You know, although mine's had a very different starting point. Sure. Uh, really fascinating, though. It's uh, th this whole very winding river in which I've been sort of, you know, floating along. Um, in a kayak of various um, disciplines. It's just, uh, it's really been enlightening, uh, fantastic education. Um, well, it's been, a, it's been a fantastic story, Ted, and thanks again. It's been, a, it's taken two years to get you on the show. We were trying to do it in person and circumstances, serendipity just hasn't made that happen. So really, really great to finally get to talk to you. And thank you so much. Any of the um, information in this interview along with links to Ted's website and links to Jenny Gardner's website where you can reach out to them to find out about the brands that they do of absinthe and any more information are going to be in the show notes. Um, yeah, thanks again and all the best on your journey. It's a fascinating story and I'm sure it hasn't ended yet. <laughs> this is just oh. the start. It hasn't ended, and I, I certainly it's been enjoyable speaking with you, and I certainly hope we get to meet in person sometime. And yeah. uh, keep up the good work. Very much enjoyed your website and your resources. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thanks.